Hello, welcome to another episode of Unlocked. I have a very awesome guest today, somebody that I have been following for a number of years. I'm super honored to have him on the show. Mike Michalowicz, if you don't know Mike, is a very influential, very impactful writer, speaker, thought leader, all types of things in the entrepreneurial space and business leader space. Um, I have three of his books right here. The Pumpkin Plan was the first one I read. Profit First, Fix This Next. Um, Clockwork is something that I have dabbled in. I haven't read the whole thing yet, and he just wrote a revised version of that that's actually expanded now. Um, so he'll talk about that at the end of this interview. Mike is, uh, I, I just, I can't say enough. Simple, he's smart. He's got ways about talking about business that are that that put him on the same stages as people like Dave Ramsey, Simon Sinek, and Seth Godin. He has shared stages with those individuals. He's spoken all over the country, all over the world. Um, he's got hundreds of thousands of newsletter subscribers, Twitter followers, podcast listeners, all types of things. He's he's got a knowledge base that is uh, that's very valuable, and I'm grateful to have him on the show. Here we go, Mike. Mike, I had no idea if I was going to get long beard Mike or short beard Mike. So what do you call this? Medium beard? Or this is, is kind of medium beard Mike. I like it, man. I like it. Yeah, I do have a long face, though. You know what's so funny, Scott, about beards is it is a polarizing thing. Half of the people I meet, like, dude, love the beard, half hate the beard, and everyone has a comment about the beard. I never I never knew. I'm, I'm not a beard guy, typically, so I never knew. Well... There you go. Like I commented on it. So I just tally me as one of them, you know, it's, but it's normal, but at least you didn't say, dude, I hate it. I love it. That's but right. I hear that constantly. And like, really? it, some people are repulsed. Like it's so disgusting. You have such a horse face already. You're so long in the face. And some people are <laughs> wait, like, I love it. Wait, Fine. people be- come up to you and say, Mike, you have a horse face. Well, pay- people I know my friends. Oh, okay. I was yeah. about to say, <laughs> could you imagine you've <laughs> That'd be, that'd be great dude you have a horse face mike. dude you have a horse face mike but some people are like oh finally it's always an insult some people are like oh finally you have a pronounced chin so i'm i'm losing no matter <laughs> oh my gosh man this and is it's traumatizing all it's all friends you have to come from beard therapy i know i know it's really humbled me my wife likes it though so it, for now it will stay that's all that matters hey man you know what we're gonna we're gonna bust that i love talking about your beard by the way but I'm sure my listeners yeah, yeah, <laughs> who aren't even looking at this are like, I don't, I can't even see him. This is not yeah. making any sense. Yeah. Let's look at this, man. Right. Oh, beautiful. I, beautiful. I just want you to tell, I just want to tell you, Mike Michalowicz, these are the three I have. Okay. I don't have, I'm not like, I'm not a full on Mike groupie, Yeah, but I am I'm pretty close. You got the All big right. three there. This, these, these are these, I will tell you right now. My wife loves and hates this book. Yeah. Yeah. Profit first. Yeah. I said, this is what we're going to do. KKA, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And she said, I don't understand anything you're doing. She looks at our bank account now and she's like, I see like all these accounts and yeah. I don't know what's going on with them. And I'm like, it's all good. Look at the bottom balance, right? But she toilet. goes, you know what she said? She said, okay. Scott, I see that after this though, you seem to have a better hold on your business finances and our personal finances. And I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. But you seem to have something going here. And yeah. I just want to thank you, man, because this profit thir- first idea yeah. blew my mind and it oh, has okay. created so much freedom for me financially. We are going on vacations. We yeah. are not yeah. strapped for all kinds of stuff because I've got a separate account for all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know what it is, Scott? It's, um, I call it a behavioral intercept. And what I did is I, I asked myself and spoke with so many entrepreneurs, what, how do you manage your money right now? And most people say, I log into my bank account to see what's there. It's like, oh, if that's what we do, that's where we need the system. We can't do it in a spreadsheet or some kind of budgeting system. Those are wonderful if we use them, but most of us don't. So, um, and it's also cool. My wife is the same way. She's like, what is the system? Cause we do it for our private finances also. And She's adopted to it. She's, she's never read my book. She never will. But she can manage the money just as easily as I can because we all know what's available for what purpose. 
That's awesome. I, I, so I know not here to talk about this. Yeah. I just want to give a personal testimonial Thank you. for all those out there. Profit first changed my life. Pumpkin plan is the first one I read. Awesome. recommended to me by somebody else. And that changed the way I positioned my company, the way nice. I go after certain things. I'm going to go back and do that like interviewee checklist thing. Yeah, yeah good, good. I, just, good. I just looked at it and I was like, oh, I got to revisit that. It's been like five years since I've done yeah. this. Man. So Night opener. I got to go out and do that. But the thing, so, you know, plethora of books. You are an author, a thought leader in all this entrepreneurial space. You have done what you call the must-haves. You've done financials, you've done productivity, you've done growth, you've done marketing yeah. and you're coming out with a new book. And yeah. I want to talk about that. Oh, cool. Let's do it. So all in. Yeah. You're tackling leadership. Yeah. Yeah. How to build unstoppable teams. I'll show you something cool. I know you can only see it, but I have my little tree back here right at the top, right there is all in, right? There it is there. Well, I got to move my finger right away. Right, right there. So, um, I do that. It's a little tradition I have the book is written. And once a book is complete, I put it up there. It won't come out until 2024. So we're recording this way in advance. It's just the pub the nature of publishing. It takes a long time. What I did in All In, and I try to do this in all my books, I, I say, well, what are we trying to address here? This is recruiting, retaining, raising the bar for employees. I then said, what's the common tactics that bring unacceptable results? And the most common tactic is the interview process. Many people do interviews. And many people are disappointed, employers, by the result. And actually, many candidates are disappointed because they don't know why they didn't get the job or someone gets the job. They don't really understand what it was. And it's a pretty flawed process. So I dug into that, among other things in this book, and found systems, methods, I believe, that are radically simpler and far more effective. So that's what the book's about. That, I can share okay. systems, too, if you want. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, the, the thing here is, like... You've got a, you're a systems guy, right? Like you yeah. develop processes and the way you think is so, it's like linear, like do this, then do that. That's why right, 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 the, right. the format of your books is like the end of it says each chapter was like, okay, here's the end. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. It's like, right. it's so easy to follow along with your books. Right. So I love that application piece. Um, talk about your, your formula, this AFSO formula thing you got yeah, going on. Or FASO, it's F-A-S-O. I, I may have realigned oh, it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what, okay. Yeah, you know, I may have realigned it. So it's fit, it's um, um, uh, ability, uh, safety, and, and ownership. So I found these are the three elements, or I'm sorry, the four elements that drive the grace engagement. So the first part is fit. And uh, it's, the, it's similar to that concept of the right people in the right seat and the right bus. So what does the business need and uh, who's the person that can satisfy it? Now, here's the notion I challenged in this. I was looking at research out there about A players. We, we all want A players for our business. So I said, well, how many, what percentage of population are A players? Uh, and this comments are all over the place, but it's usually 10 to 5%. 5 to 10% of people are A players. So most people aren't. So you have to go through this kind of exhaustive process to find the A players. And I said, well, what if everyone's an A player? We're just not finding the right fit. And so I believe everyone has a potential, meaning everyone has a potential being an A player if put in the right role. So what we need to do as employers is first identify what does the organization really need? And it's not the job title. I don't need a receptionist, for example. I need certain tasks done. And my job is to match talent to task, not talent to title. That's where most businesses go wrong. We need a receptionist to do these 10 things. But really, we need uh, individuals that can accomplish 10 different tasks. It means multiple individuals. So there's this kind of web matchup type of strategy. That's the fit. The um, ability, we've all heard you know, of experience and you can find on a resume and it's nice bringing someone with experience, but maybe the wrong experience, you may have to unlearn. Now there's been focuses on um, innate ability. So these different tests like DISC and Predictive Index and Strengths Finder and Enneagram, there's so many tools out there. And we're starting to focus on what's the innate talent. But there's this actually massive component that's the most important that very few or almost no one's looking at, which is potential ability. So innate ability is what you walk in with internally. Experiential ability is what you've gained over time and can already prove. But potential ability is what do you have the potential to do? What can you take on? So how do we find that? 
And what I teach in the book is a way of doing not interviews to find potential ability, but doing workshops. So one example is Home Depot. You may not know this has a recruiting platform that is a mind changer. They run these little workshops every weekend in the summertime, at least in our area, where you can build like a birdhouse. And so you go there and you build a birdhouse with whatever, you know, maybe your children or whoever you bring with you. And there's other parents there. Yes, they're trying to ingratiate you with Home Depot. They're trying, they want you to be a customer, but they have employees of Home Depot observing who are the greatest participants, who shows the most potential to uh, to be a great Home Depot employee because they know what they're doing and or they're asking or supporting other people. They're in, engaged with the group around them. At the end of that, they approach and say, hey, you were really good at this. Do you ever consider working at Home Depot? And they recruit employees this way through workshops. We can all do this. Don't interview, actually run a workshop where any potential candidate could come to your business to learn the skills, to improve themselves. So everyone through this process improves, and then you and I get to cherry pick who are the few people that we see have the most potential to be successful with us. And this isn't something new, by the way. It's like, oh my God, no business does this. Yeah, Home Depot does it. Uh, almost every college university does this in their sports recruiting program. I played sports in college, and I and, um when I was in high school, I went to Hobart to play lacrosse, uh, Hobart camp to play lacrosse. It's a, it's a popular school for lacrosse. And there was hundreds of athletes there from all the different high schools. And they were teaching all of us to get better at the sport. And they cherry picked, not me, but they cherry picked certain athletes there and said, Hey, you'd be great, a great player at Hobart. And they were recruiting. So everyone's elevated and the right fits are engaged. That's how we uh, identify or find potential ability. Um, the next thing is uh, safety. We, we need safety in the environment we work in. That's actually generally the biggest compromise of our performance is we don't feel physically safe or relationally safe or safe or emotionally safe. If I say the truth of how I'm feeling about something, is there going to be consequences and so forth? So we need to set an environment where people feel that they can be their full expressive selves. And how do you do that? You give opportunities for people to express themselves, to talk about themselves. So people are coming to work, not just to work, but for the social acts, uh, aspect of ex self-expression. And we as a leader need to deliver that. The last part is ownership. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, or questions I hear is, I wish I knew a way for my employees to act like owners. I want my employees to act like owners. So I said, well, how do we get employees, teams to act like owners? And I found there was research done in the 70s that subsequently was kind of abandoned called psychological ownership. There's certain techniques that we can deploy where someone will feel like they own something, even if they don't legally own something. So the classic example is uh, you can have a rental car or you can own a car. And the way we behave is differently. Like we, no one takes a rental car to a car wash, but your own car, you probably do. But your own car, you may not even legally own. The bank may own it. There's something that happens once we feel we have possession. We treat things with much more engagement. We treat it much better. So how do you deploy ownership? Well, first of all, is uh, you give people control over it, meaning they can keep the car in their own driveway and so forth. So some form of control. Secondly, and most importantly, I think personalization. I can make it my own. I can hang the dice balls from my car. I, you know, A rental car is usually very generically plain. A personal car probably has some personal effects in it. And there we have a sense of ownership. And then the last component is intimate knowledge. I used to have vinyl records. I grew up in the 70s. Vinyl records. And when the record spin, I knew exactly what song, what beat I would hear the scratch in the record. That was my record. And I was actually surprised when I heard on the radio that it didn't have the scratch in it. But when we have personal intimate knowledge of something, we become more possessive of that thing. So when we assign work to our colleagues, what can we give them to give them intimate knowledge? What can we do to give them the opportunity to personalize it and have control over it? Now, the last thing I want to share is there's a little bit of a dark side here. If you give too much, people can build thiefdoms and they start protecting and defending their area, which could actually harm the company. So we want to give ownership to multiple people when that becomes what's called collective ownership. So many people have insights, but they all feel they own that object, which is in part your business. Mm, this is so good. Okay. A big download. <laughs> uh, this is this this is good. So what what's the biggest mistake though that that people are making when they're, when they're trying to build teams, right? When they're trying to build successful teams, uh, you obviously came up with this four-part framework to yeah. help solve the, what, what is the core issue that 
entrepreneurs, leaders are having when developing these teams? We think that our teams care about the corporate goal. So we come out and say, this is the time our company's doing $10 million or our division is going to uh, you know, launch a new product. No one cares about the corporate goals except for the people who set them because they have ownership over them because they set them. So the owner of the business cares. I get the new car, the bigger house. I get to brag that my business has grown, but my colleagues, my employees may not care. But everyone cares about their own path. Everyone cares about their own vision for themselves. So what a business leader should do is to engage every colleague, every team member and say, what's your own personal vision? What are you looking to achieve through this career in your life? And then align the paths for our individual team members to achieve their own goals while we march toward the corporate goal, which is the leader's goal. And if everyone's achieving their own goals and you're marking off along the way, the momentum becomes unstoppable. Just to give context, we test everything out in my own businesses. At this office right here, we have 10 employees. So we're an itty-bitty company. And um, we meet once a quarter. We actually just happened to do it off the, the calendar quarter. We just had, actually did it last week. And we sit down. I'll show you. I'll pull it up real quick. Um, we have, individ- this is mine, individual goal tracking. Um, these are all personal visions and dreams I have. But we do it for every employee. We then have a big tracker right outside my office here on the wall of people achieving their dreams. And so now what people feel and I feel is, wow, the company cares more than just Mike's corporate goal. We care about our individual accomplishments. We're recognizing it. We're celebrating it. And therefore, people are more engaged. It's reciprocity. The more I care about you, the more you're likely to care about me, as long as it's true and authentic. So that's what we need to do. That's cool. Because I, it aligns with something I, I do and I talk about like a purpose tree, right? Like I, I call this thing a purpose tree. And when I'm developing a why or purpose for a company, you've got the cor- the corporate purpose, like well, what's our why, okay? Then I've got branches that come off of that, which are like divisional or departmental wise. Yes. And then you've got nested wise that are like individual people wise. And they all need to be combined and connected. And if we need to work on your personal why, you should be able to draw a circle around it and then point it back in some way to the corporate because that's how you're going to get buy-in. So it sounds a little bit like what you're talking about. So much so. Ironically, we use an actual tree. We have a barren tree outside this office and we attach, we tape leaves to it. So every time someone accomplishes their own personal goals, it's it's a new leaf on the tree. And this tree now has bloomed magnificently. So much so that we're talking about setting up another tree because so many individual dreams have been accomplished. That is so cool. It almost sounds a little bit like artsy craftsy. I think you're like, <laughs> r- like you're running an elementary school over there. What's like art, but it's like so cool. Like visually, that's got to be so impactful when you walk by that and just see like what's going on. Yeah. And we're big believers of that. I wish I could take you for a little mini tour here of the office. We have a I'll lot on my of- way. I'll be there. Yeah, be on your way. yeah. So we have the tree. We have other things. Uh, another thing that our, our president Kelsey did here, which is genius, including the book, is outside of everyone's cubicle or office is a picture of them when they were a child. So you you come into my office, you see a picture of me when I was six or seven years old. And what the argument is, is we're all still the same human being. And the way we have rapport with each other is differently. It's not you're talking at this very adult professional level, realize there's an inner child to each person. It's a much more intimate connection in the way we communicate. Man, I love that. That's so, that because we are. We're human, yeah. right? And sometimes we put on these facades of titles or, right. um, you know, we right. have all this other stuff going on and right. it's like, no, dude, like, you know, Mike, I, you've written 28,000 books, but like, you're just, you're, you know, you're the kid that skinned his knee riding his bike down the I'm, street. I'm long face, horse face, Mike. Long, horse face, Mike. Horse I mean, face Mike dude, with the yeah, yeah, he's harmless. He's harmless. But, but, so. yes, and, and you know what, to your point, it's harmless. And, and that's what the power is. Is I think with titles, there is this provocation, this this aloofness, and I can't approach someone because that's the they're the big deal. But when we see we're all coming from the same playing field, it, there's this openness that comes about. Mike, you're a rock star, man. This I've, rock. I've been looking forward to this interview for so long. Not only because I'm a you know half 50% Mike McCallowitz groupie, but just yeah. because I knew you would have something to add. Like this is so cool. So all in. You, we are recording this way ahead of time. Okay. This is, you know, this will come out over, over time, this episode, Um, but all in it's in 2024, but what are you doing right now? How do people get in touch with you? What do you want people to do right now? Yeah. So um, I just finished clockwork revised and expanded. I rewrote the entire book. It's about business efficiency. 
So I think if you're looking to improve the way your business or division operates, Clockwork may be the source to check out. The place to go is MikeMotorbike.com, as in the motorcycle. You can go to Mike Michalowicz, no one can spell it. So go to MikeMotorbike.com. Every book I have there, you can get free chapter downloads. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. You can get that content there. And I have a podcast uh, up there too. Brilliant. Mike, you are awesome. I really appreciate you're you. Awesome. And I, I I appreciate the value you're adding to the world for oh, with your, your knowledge. That means the world it's, to me. It's super smart. And I just, it's simple and smart. And I think Thank that's you. what makes it so valuable and easy to implement. So everybody jump out there, grab Mike's stuff. It's good. I think something that's really interesting to think about is this whole fit thing that he mentioned right at the beginning, uh, because you know we tend to look at people and just go, "Nah, they're they're useless. They cannot perform that job. They are not a good employee." And we just bunch them all up and we chuck them out because you know they couldn't do that thing. But what if it just wasn't? They're they're perfectly capable. They're talented. They're competent. And other things, just not that thing. What if we moved them to something else where they could thrive? I've heard so many stories of that happening over the years of people that just weren't thriving and then we moved them and then bam, gold. And uh, that's that's where we need to land. With thinking about fit, um, thinking about ability, that potential ability. Are we looking at people's potential or are we just looking at their straight up ability right now, okay? What is the potential for this individual going down the line? Safety. Are we creating psychological safety? Project Aristotle, which was a study done by Google, analyzed you know, 150 teams inside of Google and said, what is the top thing that indicates a high-performing team? Number one, psychological safety. Do people feel safe? Do they feel heard? Do they feel like they can say things without being dominated or ridiculed or whatever like that that's really really important and then ownership how do we get people to hang you know to hang the dice right to to, to make it their own to where they can feel ownership even though they don't technically own it i thought that car analogy was was really really good um again this this book all in is coming out in 2024 so if you're listening to this before then just get clockwork, get one of his other books. You're, all of them are good, okay? I'm just gonna say, all of them are good. If you're getting this after 2024, go back and get all in and check that out. I'm really, again, grateful um, for his knowledge. If y'all wanna find out more about me, you can go to scottwaldron.com and like, subscribe, comment on this YouTube channel. Or if you're listening to this anywhere else, please do the same there. I will uh, be very, very grateful. All right, everybody, till next time, I'll see you on another episode of Unlocked.